that is going to blow some people away. But really, that would be my choice for a fast cycling rifle with minimal recoil and still sticking with that. Hey everybody, Ron Spomer back at you with the Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. And before I get into our questions and answers today, I have to show you this target. I was doing some videos on uh, a rifle, a rifle that I was testing for accuracy as well as function and everything else. So I've got this sheet. I don't know if you're listening to a podcast, obviously you can't see it, but take my word for it. This is pretty impressive. I have ammo groups that I shot that um, expand. Yeah, you know, the usual, you got an inch group, an inch and a half group. And then I've got a group right here, 0.436 inches, center to center, 0.436. That's better than a half minute of angle, folks. Here's one from the same ammunition, Federal, with a 40 green bullet. So, you know, I'm shooting a pretty light little 22 here. It's actually a 223. But this one is a group of 0.530. So just a little more than a half inch. And then we've got a nozzler load here that comes in at three quarters of an inch. We've got uh, another nozzle load that's under an inch, another one that's 0. 0.650 inch. When we got up to the 77 grain bullets though, eh, accuracy went south. We got two, two and a half inch groups. So it obviously doesn't stabilize those all that well. What was the rifle? You're going to be blown away. A lever action. A Henry Long Ranger Express lever action rifle. And I'm going to cover it in a deep dive video on Ron Spomer Outdoors TV. That's a subscription service, but that's the kind of stuff we show on that. So if you want to check that out, and yeah, we're going to be putting a lot more rifle reviews on that channel. And boy, it's really fun to find a lever action that shoots half inch. I've never seen such a thing before. Fun. All right, let's get to our questions and see if we can come up with some answers. Here is one that was on uh, my sheet from last time. I did one of these and didn't get around to it. Went too long. So David asks, is copper king? I'm sure he meets copper bullets here. <laughs> uh, with advancements in monolithic bullets being what they are today, is there a future for cup and core, partition, and bonded bullets in the hunting landscape? <laughs> well, David, I think that is a good question. and I think we are in the midst of an evolution in bullets. It's pretty obvious. Um, but the evolution in in well-designed bonded partition cup and core bullets is, is rolling right along too. I think what would probably cause the demise of those would be increasingly government regulations on their, against their use. Uh, I know people absolutely hate this government interference stuff, but you know, just as we've taken lead out of paint and asbestos out of buildings and lead out of gasoline and Heavy metal contamination is a serious issue, and I don't know that it's justifiably a serious issue in bullets, but they're even taking it out of fishing sinkers uh, these days. Just because there are animals that will pick this stuff up and die as a result, and there's plenty of scientific evidence in support of that. I've seen it. I did quite a bit of research, and I talked to some hunter friends of mine who work with raptors, and they study this stuff. And there's no doubt that they are eating, um, picking up lead bullet fragments from deer that are either shot or lost or uh, field dressed and you leave the what behind and there's fragments of lead in there. And I've, I've also seen some experiments in which we've shot 130 grain cup and core, 270 bullets into jugs of water with a basin, a catch basin underneath. And in that catch basin underneath, we came up with all the particles of the bullet you would not believe how many particles of lead were there. Not two or three or 10, dozens in such fine, fine little pieces that it's inevitable that some of that's going to be in the meat somewhere and an animal's going to eat it, the bird's going to eat it, and the birds definitely get lead poisoning. I don't know that humans do. I would imagine we eat a chunk of lead and it's going to pass right through. Um, but there is some concern about it. They've done some studies with hogs and found that the, they picked up a little bit elevated lead levels in the blood. So I think that's what would do, probably do in lead bullets. The manufacturers are a little bit worried about that right now. But overall, I don't think it's a huge problem because our bald eagle population has been increasing for the last 20, 30 years after they got rid of DDT. So we're really doing well on bald eagles. Most of the raptor population is doing really well. The only sticking point for 
for raptors, um, carrion eating style raptors would be the California condor. And that's where all of this got started. And that is extremely well documented. Every hunting season, they would get a bunch of sick condors in that had elevated blood levels of lead. And then they would chelate that lead out of the birds and they would be fine. and could fly again and they'd release them. And then the next year, they'd get the same bird back. They put a tag on it, <laughs> same bird back with lead in it again from feeding on some deer carcass. So it was a serious issue. And I would, I'd say it would be foolish for hunters not to be justifiably concerned about it the same as anyone else is. What really drives me crazy are, are hunters who get a little bit upset with too many regulations and whatnot, and they throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is to say we give short shrift con to concerns about endangered species like the California condor and say, well, who cares? You know, it's going extinct anyway. It's left over from the dinosaur age and all this stuff. That doesn't do us any good PR, guys. I mean, as, as hunters and what we advertise ourselves as being true conservationists, we need to toe the line. And it's silly to think that we're going to just ignore inadvertent lead poisoning uh, from our activities on a species as fragile as the California condor. You know, it, it might be on its way out naturally because we no longer have all the big dead animals lying around that we had back in the day uh, when there were dinosaurs or at least uh, in the, Paleolithic era, whatever it was back when their saber tooth cats and the La Brea tar pits and all the giant cave bears and different things that we had back in those days. Um, I just think it, it behooves us to say, hey, we have great alternatives. We don't have to use a lead core bullets. In some areas, that might not be a problem at all. I don't think we need to do a blanket condemnation. And at the same time, I think we need to celebrate the fact that we have got some wonderful alternatives in copper bullets. There are so many brands out there now that are making wonderfully effective, accurate, precision shooting and terminal performance, all copper bullets, that personally, I make the switch just because of the performance, even without worrying about feeding my grandkids lead contaminated meat. So that's what I think is going to be happening there. Now, let's see if we can find some more questions here. I bet we've got them. Here is one. All right. This is 1AF7. 1AF7? And the question is, what one rifle that you swear by for all or most North American game? <laughs> I don't know how many times I've answered this question, but I've been, you know, we've been debating this one ever since I was a kid in my first deer camp. What rifle have you got? What caliber are you shooting? Mine's better than yours. No, it's not. Oh, man. It's always a fun, entertaining argument. And, and I, always, I always tell you guys honestly that I do not have one favorite rifle or one favorite cartridge. But I would swear by a .30-06 for all North American game because I know it works. It's been proven time and time again. But at the same time, I can say the same thing for darn near every other cartridge out there. Obviously not something ridiculously small or ridiculously oversized. You don't need to hunt with a 500 Nitro Express for pronghorns, for gosh sake. Um, but it will certainly work. And the 270 will certainly work for all of North American game. It's been used on everything, including big brown bears and polar bears, used successfully. Uh, but so has the uh, 35 Whalen. It really doesn't come down to what's the one cartridge rifle that you swear by, because I think most of us understand that the right bullet in the right place is going to do the job. And then we can choose our favorite style of rifle, weight, balance, and all the rest of it, and say, this is the one that I swear by, and more power to you. Um, it, it's a great way to go to have a rifle that you have faith in, a cartridge and a bullet that you have faith in, you know is going to work. Man, that's half the battle. And when you know what you can do and what your tools can do, you are set to concentrate on being a hunter and not having second thoughts in the back of your mind that compromise your abilities. So, yeah, get, get yourself that gun and that cartridge and that bullet that you find works for you and you have faith in because it has always worked. And if someday it starts to not work, analyze why not. Think about it. Was it me or was it the rifle or was it the bullet? Or does the cartridge not drive it fast enough? Or does it recoil too much that I can't handle it and I'm flinching? A lot of things to consider. 
But as a general rule, any bullet going somewhere in the realm of, say, 2,700 feet per second to 3,400 feet per second and weighing somewhere from, mm, I'm going to go down as light as 80 grains. (laughs) Could probably go a little bit lighter than that even with a good shot. Um, on up to whatever you want to handle, but gosh, somewhere under 200 grains, really. So ideally, 100 to 180 grain range. If you can put those two together and deliver it to the right spot, you're covered. You're going to get the job done. Oh, that's my waffling answer on that one. (laughs) This is Dima. Dima asks, what is the point of hunting animals if you're not going to eat them? (laughs) Well, that is a good question, actually. Um, First of all, though, it's kind of a bad assumption that people are hunting animals that they're not eating, although it does happen. And first, I want to say that all game animals not only are eaten, but must be eaten. This idea that there are these trophy hunters and the only reason they're out there is to cut the head off and brag about the big antlers that they got or something like that. Yes, plenty of people brag about their accomplishments. You know, it's no different than a football game or a tennis match or anything else where you win and you win a trophy, catch a big fish, grow the world's biggest tomato, or win the local pumpkin contest or something. You get your picture in the paper with your blue ribbon and your prize trophy pumpkin. <laughs> well, mine was a white tail. Sorry. <laughs> but it doesn't mean I threw it away. Heavens no, that's just a little part of it. The trophy is, first of all, the opportunity to have conducted that hunt to be out there in the wild and still have abundant wildlife the way we do, thanks in large measure to hunters who dote on these animals and insist on maintaining their populations and improving their populations. More habitat, saving wetlands, saving grasslands and forests, building nesting boxes, helping out however we can. This is not just a myth. This is reality. It's a big deal. The reason we have an abundance of wildlife in North America today is because of conservation hunters. They started all the programs. They started the idea of closed seasons and limits, game wardens to protect, and then saving the habitat. That is the most critical part. Not a lot of people go deer hunting in downtown LA or Los An- or New York City or Chicago. You've got to have rural landscapes and not soybean fields either. You've got to have wild lands, native animals in native habitats with native plant communities, the whole ball of wax. And that's what we hunters insist on defending and improving. And that's why it drives me nuts when we get people out there who think we go hunting to shoot animals, cut their heads off and go home. It just doesn't happen. Now, that's not to say there aren't some slime balls out there. Let's call an call it what it is, who would do something like that. We have always had poachers and vandals in every aspect of life, and this is one of them. But we we conservation hunters who pay for the licenses that pay for the game wardens are out there stopping these people as much as we can. And there are some wonderful programs, not just in North America, but around the world where we've done that, and we continue to do that. And Southern Africa is a great example of it. We've covered this several times. Hunters are the driving force behind wildlife restoration in Namibia and South Africa and Zambia and Mozambique. There are just some unbelievably, outstandingly successful conservation stories there, and they all are because of hunters who create a demand for the product. If you want to hunt whatever species, you know you have to have that species, and the only way you can have that species is to help provide its habitat. So, yeah. Now, little caveat. There is a reason to hunt an animal that you're not going to eat. I have never eaten a skunk, but I have hunted some skunks who were hunting my chickens. It's a perfect example. It's the same as a mouse in your house or bats in your attic or ants in the pantry. There's just some animals that you don't want around, and you're not going to gently shoo-shoo them away Convenience suggests that if we've stolen their habitat, we're in their way, they're in our way, we're going to get rid of them. Just like a grizzly bear coming up and killing you in your campsite because you're in his area, he's got the right to do that. Now, I'm not saying we have the right to go out indiscriminately killing all animals because they inconvenience us. But there are occasions in which we do need to remove certain problem animals. And that's why when you go to 
well, <laughs> you used to go to the yellow pages and look up animal control and get some guy to come get the bats out of your belfry or the skunk out from under your porch. <laughs> I don't know where you find them these days. You go online and find them. But <laughs> the reason those services exist are because we do not all tolerate rats in our house and we get rid of them. So that's the reason for hunting certain animals. And and then there are controls when they get overpopulated because let's face it, many times a certain species, because of what man has done to change the habitats, overpopulates and endangers itself as well as other wildlife. Um, and there have been many, many documented cases of this happening. And they need to be culled, is what they call it. And this even happens in national parks around, really around the world. It's been done in Grand Canyon National Park. It's done over in Africa in a lot of the natural national parks because it's possible to have too many animals. And I've seen them. I've seen them in uh, Wanky National Park in Zimbabwe where they had an estimated at the time 30,000 elephants. 30,000 elephants in one park. Now, they would leave the park and go raid crops and whatever at night, and then they'd come back in because they were protected in the park. But that park was devastated. Trees were dead, pushed over. Grasslands were just denuded. And I, the first time I'd ever visited, so I asked a uh, ranger, I said, well, what's going on that nothing grows here? The elephants were eating it all. And that means there's nothing left for other species. So they have to control those populations. They have to knock them down. He said the carrying range there was estimated at 3,000 elephants, and they had 30,000. So, yes, there are reasons sometimes to kill animals. If you don't have the habitat, you have to take care of it. Okay, John's question. How do you reckon a 30 at 6 stacks up against a 9.3 by 62 on driven boar? Well, I would imagine that driven boar, A, don't like either one, <laughs> and uh, B, don't even like to be driven. <laughs> But boy, is that a, uh, a common and popular way to hunt boar in Europe. I have not done it over there. I've been there a few times, but I haven't hunted driven boar. But I would imagine, gosh, I, you know, I would take the 30 out six myself. And my reasoning is this. Both of them have plenty of bullet to kill a big boar. That's not the issue for me anyway. Um, you could argue you get a little more effect out of that bigger bullet than the 9.3. That's a 0.36, 6-inch diameter bullet versus a 30, a 308 bullet in the 30 out 6. But they're, they're both more than capable of handling the biggest boar. The question is, are you capable of handling them? Recoil. If you're shooting more than just once and, and a running animal and you're not able to control your recoil or you can't get back for your second shot coming out of recoil, Lighter kicking rifles are easier to handle. Yeah, you might do just fine with your first shot, but what about your second, your third, and your fourth? And I have seen some videos of these incredible rifle shots over there on these driven boar hunts, <laughs> and they will be going, bang, got one, bang, got one, bang, got one. <laughs> they just keep shooting and dropping these animals with perfect head shots. It's crazy, but I don't think they're going to do it with heavy recoiling rifles. Covey stopped up here for a visit. You can't see her on the podcast, and you probably can't even see her on the YouTube because she's so short down here under the table. But trust me, this is Covey. What you about? What you been up to, Cove? You gonna go back down now? You made your cameo. <laughs> that was a pretty weak cameo for a dog. Um. So yeah, I would say that would be my choice. And you know what? Don't tell anybody. But if I were doing that driven hunt, I would probably use a three hundred eight Winchester instead of a thirty out six. <laughs> That is going to blow some people away because I'm always railing against the 308. But really, that would be my choice for a fast cycling rifle with minimal recoil and still sticking with that 30 caliber bullet. Uh, I don't know if I'd shoot 165s or 180s. I think I'd go with a 165 and I'd probably get an all copper because they penetrate so well. But you no, know, that's variable, we would see. But I think that would be a good option too. But I don't think you're going to suffer with either one of them. Um, but 30-06 would be my choice. All right, John, thanks for that one. This is JK, and JK asks, Ron, here's a question to kick around. Which caliber is the hardest for the manufacturers to build a bullet for? Oh, you know, I don't think there's much of an issue there anywhere. Um, I've watched several bullet manufacturers making their products. And the cup and core bullet, 
of the drawn bullet with the drawn jacket and pretty standard stuff. You just get your dies all set up to take a, a disc of gilding metal, the jacket material, and then you start punching it and drawing it. They call it the punch and draw process. And what you do is you convert that flat disc into a long tube. And then another machine has a big roll of lead in a cable form that comes off and it runs down with the machinery that gets pushed down into the cup or the cup pushed up over it and then snipped off. And then it goes to the next stage and it gets squeezed or swaged into the shape of the bullet. And there's your standard cup and core bullet. I can't imagine that it's any harder to make one of those in a 27 or a 30 or a 35 or a 40 or maybe a 17. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think so, though. Once you've got your machinery set up for it, I can't see where there's a heck of a lot of problem. Now, the other way to make bullets, the common way, are the all-copper bullets where you take the copper rod and you cut it, and then you can either... Let me remember what I saw at Barnes one time years and years ago. They had it marching down the line, getting squeezed into shape, I believe. Man, it seems crazy. Yeah, squeeze into shape, and then they punch a nose hollow into it. But a lot of them now are actually lathe turning using a CNC machine. So the computer adjusts all the machinery to carve this bullet on a lathe. So it's spinning, and it shaves it down. You've probably seen videos of this kind of a thing. Cuts it off, and you've got yourself a perfect bullet that's been controlled by a computer. And again, I don't see a huge challenge in making one over another. So, but I will have to honestly tell you, this is just conjecture based on what I've seen and what I know. I can't swear to it. Anybody out there who's making bullets, let us know. I would imagine the toughest bullet to make is one that involves more parts, like a copper with a shank has lead in it and a nose that has some lead in it, or maybe uh, a hollow in the nose or partials, all of these complicated ones. You know, the more different parts you put in, the harder it is to make that bullet. But I don't think the caliber has a big effect on it. All right, good one. Now, this is Nelly 51. Oh, Nelly 51. I can hardly read this. Can you tell us what type of cartridge you would like to see created? Or maybe get a second chance to become successful? Yeah. I really don't think I need to see another cartridge created. <laughs> I'm with a lot of these guys who are complaining about all these new cartridges. My God, they're so redundant. How many do we need? Well, obviously, we don't need any, but eh, we do come up with some pretty interesting little innovations from time to time. So I'm not against creating new cartridges. I just don't absolutely see a need for them. But then again, I've been around and used enough that I'm at that stage in life where I would just as soon take what I know and go hunting rather than having to learn it all over again. <laughs> but that's probably saying more about me than the cartridges. So there, there's my first statement. I don't need to see a new cartridge, but I like this second chance cartridge idea. Boy, are there a lot of those that need to be out there. Oh my gosh. One of them has to be the six millimeter Remington just because it was the second centerfire rifle I ever bought as a kid. And I loved it then, and I still love it, and I could never understand why it came in second place to the 243 Winchester, which I also love. And the reason I like the six more, probably two reasons. One, I always like the underdog. And two, it outperforms the 243 Winchester. They're both short actions. They're both 243s, obviously. So they shoot the same bullets, but the 6 millimeter Remington is 100 feet per second faster on average than the 243 Winchester. So why didn't everybody go for that one? Because we're always so crazy about getting the latest and the greatest and the fastest, right? Huh. Well, of course, the old story, most of us know it, was the twist rate issue. The 243 Winchester came out with a twist rate of 1 in 10 inches. And that poor 6 millimeter, I think they set it at 1 in 12. So that meant that a 90 grain bullet of the standard shape in those days, this flat based spire point bullet, you could throw a 90 grain bullet from the six millimeter Remington and stabilize it. Bingo, let's go deer hunting. Oh no, you can't hunt deer with a 90 grain bullet. It's too light. Or at least that was what they claim people thought. 
Whereas with the Winchester, they came out with 100 grain bullets. Oh boy, 10 grains more bullet. Let's go deer hunting. And they bought that. So Remington supposedly was thinking that their six millimeter would be more of a varmint round, a coyote round, and maybe get used a little bit for deer hunting. Whereas Winchester thought this is the perfect combination coyote, red fox, varmints in the hay field, and deer round. 243 Winchester. We're going to throw 100 grain bullets, 80 grain bullets. I think that was those were the first two they put out. Eventually they got down to 75 grain hollow points. And then he, these days you can get down to like a 58 grain bullet, maybe even a 55 grain bullet into 243. The six millimeter, poor guy, been suffering. Nobody chambers for it anymore. Ruger's kind of the last one, but it's a great little round. I'd like to see that one come back. And real quick now, they tell me I'm running out of time, but a second chance cartridge would probably be, oh, golly, there's so many. And really, I was going to say 264 Win Mag, but now we've got so many 6.5s out there that do that plus that I don't think we really need to worry about that anymore. And, uh, oh, that's still going strong. 270 WSM, I think, is fading, and I wish it wouldn't. I really think that is a viable cartridge. I really like it. I've used it a lot, so I'd like to see that one come on again, be a little bit stronger. I'm sure there are others I'm not thinking of right now. It's a little distracting when I've got the crew back there going, whoa, wrap this up, Ron. So <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. I am going to wrap it up. And uh, we'll pull up some more questions for the next time. Hey, I really want to thank you guys for listening in. Really helps, uh, especially our patrons who support us. Folks, we really appreciate that support. If you can uh, subscribe to the channel, that would help. Give us a thumbs up. And we will be looking for more questions from you guys. Let me know if I got anything wrong on this one. And if you have some better answers, uh, we always invite that. Maybe we'll even uh, put you up on the next question and answer as the guy or the gal with the proper answer. This is Ron Spomer on Honest and Shoot Straight.